Okay, welcome to um, Brave Church of Christ. This is our class on parables, and we're going to be looking at the parables of stewardship in lesson number eight. Um, no doubt, as you look at God's word, you see that um, God has blessed us with so many things, um, with possessions, with abilities, with blessings of all sorts. And yet there is an expectation uh, from our Father that we're good stewards, we're good managers of those things. And so we're going to look at these parables that deal with that aspect. Jesus gave parables about that very thing, of us being good stewards with what God has blessed us with. We're so glad that you've joined us. And so the parables of stewardship we're going to look at, uh, number one, the parable of the unrighteous steward. This tend to be one of the more difficult uh, parables, and so we're going to kind of take our time with it. But this parable is found in Luke 16, 1 through 13. Um, and then we're going to look at two very similar but different parables, and that is the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, 14 through 30, and the parable of the Minas, Luke 19, 11 through 27. So I'm going to kind of watch our time here. I got the timer set right here. Um, may only go through this first one because um, the second and third one take a little bit more time, and we might just do them next week in a separate lesson. Lesson be, if you will. So let's go over to the parable of the righteous steward. Um, let's turn over to Luke 16, and we're going to read Luke 16, uh, 1 through 13. All right, Luke 16, beginning verse 1. Now, he was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. He called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, what shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do. So that when I'm removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors. And he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, all right. Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write out 80. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of right, unrighteous wealth, who then will tr entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. 
Now, I do want to read the aftermath. I want to read verse 14. Now, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things, and they were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of of God. And we're going to stop right there. So like we always want to do, we want to ask this question. We, we just read the parable. We're going to go through it. But what is the setting of this parable? What, what happened before it? Is there something that motivates Jesus to deliver this parable? Well, it does seem that this flows right after Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15, we did a few lessons ago where we talked about the parables of the lost, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And those were parables about um, the father, God the father's response to when a lost soul comes and is saved. That which is lost is found. And of course, there's much rejoicing. Now, you might remember in Luke 15 and in verse 2 that these parable, parables seem to be in response to the Pharisees and scribes who were grumbling at Jesus, saying, this man receives sinners and he even eats with them. And so Jesus uses that to, to correct that ungodly behavior. Well, this is spoken right after that. Jesus goes right into this parable. So it appears that we have yet another parable that Jesus addresses to the Jewish leadership. The Jewish leadership that has it all wrong. They are hypocrites. They are fleshly. Um, they are trying to control the people. And so Jesus is speaking this parable to his disciples. And you can see that very clearly, verse 1. Now he was saying to the disciples, but it appears that it is directed toward the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, that is speaking of, again, the problem within them. Now, no doubt, Jesus wants the disciples to learn from those heirs. And I also believe that this is from the Pharisees because of what we read in verse 14. The Pharisees were listening to this, and it appears that they understood he was talking to them. And so they were scoffing. They were ridiculing or mocking what Jesus was saying. And that is a very typical reaction when people perceive that something is hitting them directly, that they're being addressed, that their air is being brought forth. Um, a lot of times people find it easier to ridicule, to mock, rather than to, to look inward and to say, yeah, that's, that's some truth there. So that is the setting of the parable. And I think it's important that we understand that setting, that context. So let's talk a little bit about the parable and the characters and what happens here. So the first thing is you have a master. He's referred to as a rich man, okay? And so I think it's very clear that this master represents God. Um, the Bible often speaks about God as the Lord, the master, and he has servants. You and I are servants and he is our Lord. And so it makes very good sense that that's what we're talking about here. And even though the master deals with his servants about physical things, it is clear from the lesson, the lessons that Jesus brings out at the end, that Jesus is really talking 
about the significance of a spiritual stewardship. Okay? And not only that, Jesus brings out that our spiritual stewardship and what our master puts in our charge, allows us to be responsible for, is directly related to um, how we use our physical stewardship, how we handle and manage the things that God has blessed us with physically. If we don't do well with the things that he's blessed us with physically, then that's going to relate to a less blessed stewardship spiritually. There's a connection there. The Father is looking at how we do physically to see what he'll put in our charge spiritually. So the master, the rich man here, is God. And then you have what I call the unrighteous steward. Um, in the New American Standard, he is referred to as a manager. And that's a good term. That's what a steward was. He was a manager of things, of his master. It might have been a few things. But what we're talking about is the chief steward. This is the steward that's in charge of everything, owned by the master. Probably the best example we have of this is when Joseph, all the way back in the book of Genesis, was um, the chief steward for Potiphar. And so he was overall everything. And, and in fact, it says that Joseph's master, Potiphar, did not care for anything. He just had complete trust in Joseph. All he ever thought about and, and only cared about um, was make a decision as to what he was going to eat every day. Everything else he left up to Joseph because whatever Joseph touched, it was golden. It succeeded. So we're talking about a chief steward here. And in verse 8, it talks about him being an unrighteous steward an unrighteous manager. Well, I think that represents the Pharisees. And you see that in verse 14. Um, but obviously, this would fit anyone that is a poor steward. Those who squander their blessings. Those who, in essence, maybe even try to benefit by ripping off other people. Uh, that's not what a steward is. A steward has to be trustworthy, loyal. And so I think that's what the unrighteous steward represents. Okay. So in this, this parable, the master has been told, listen, your chief steward has been um, embezzling from you. He's been stealing from you. And all of a sudden, the master's like, wow, okay. And he must have done some investigation because he comes to the unrighteous steward, the chief steward, and he says, you need to give an account of your stewardship. But even before he can give an account of his stewardship, he takes the stewardship away from him. It's he, he's fired in essence. And so... Now he knows that his stewardship is gone. He's lost his job. Um, he's been in that job a long time. He describes himself as an old man. And now he's kind of panicking as to what he's going to do, how he's going to survive. Because he knows in giving an account of his stewardship, he's guilty. He knows he's in big trouble. So you'll notice he starts to think, he starts to reason with himself. And he says, listen, I'm not strong enough. I'm, I'm just too old to, to do manual labor. Um, I, I'm too prideful. I'm, I would be ashamed to beg, okay? And I, I would tell you that even at my current age, uh, those, those two things are probably true of me as well. 
Uh, I'm not strong enough to do manual labor to support myself. And um, I'm too prideful to beg. I would not want to beg. I, I'd want to find some other way. So he's thinking, thinking, and this man might be unrighteous, but he's very shrewd, a term that means he's, he's very smart, but he uses his smarts to do evil, to do wrong. And so the word shrewd most often is used of people that are very motivated, very clever, very smart, but, but all of that is used to prosper in evil ways, unrighteous ways. And that's key to understanding what this parable is all about. So what he does is he goes to all of his master's um, clients who owe him things, right? And he goes to them, he says, hey, listen, how much do you owe my master? And he says, well, I, I owe a, a, a hundred something of oil. He says, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to break you a deal here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do you a favor, right? And it's almost as he's saying, I'm going to do you a favor, and you're just going to owe me one someday. And so he says, instead of 100, just, just pay off 80. I'm going to knock off 20. I'm going to give you a 20% discount, and we'll call it even. You get 100, but you only pay back 80. And he goes, the other one, same thing, 100 bushels of wheat. He said, listen, just, just write out 80. And he does that with all of his master's debtors. Now, what is he doing in essence? He's one, one more time before he's removed. He's ripping off his master. He's taking money away from him. That's why he is the unrighteous steward. And what most people believe is he's doing this, that once he goes out there and he no longer has ability to provide for himself, he's going to call in all these favors. And that's how he's going to support himself. Um, now, here's the thing that really gets difficult. When his master comes and finds out what he has done, look at verse 8. His master praises him. He's not, I mean, he might be upset, but he's not showing it. He doesn't yell at him. It's, it's like he's impressed at how shrewd this guy is. And that's one of the, the hard things about this parable is that it's this, this ugly parable. This, this steward rips off his master, gets fired, rips him off again, and the master's like, wow, I'm impressed. We're used to parables teaching us good lessons about righteousness. But what we have here are good lessons from unrighteousness. And you might say, well, that, that doesn't sit well with me. I, I don't get that. Well, the reason is that Jesus ultimately is making a comparison. He's making a comparison of the unrighteous in the world and what, they, what they're motivated and how motivated they are to accomplish all of the unrighteous goals that they have. And he uses that to compare to God's stewards who have stewardship, who have management over the greatest things, who are headed for the greatest blessing of all, eternal life with God. And he says, I don't see the same desire. I don't see the same excitement. They're, they're working towards something that is 
invaluable, is priceless. And they're not working as hard and as intelligent as the sons of men. They're not as motivated as these Pharisees and Jewish leaders. And that's a problem. He wants his disciples to, to know you've got to be motivated. You should be motivated to be intelligent stewards, to, to be excited stewards. Because what you have at your disposal, what you're working for, is eternal. It's not fleshly. It's not physical. It's not going to fade away like these others. And so there's a comparison where we're actually looking at the unrighteousness and their motivation in a positive way. But what we need to understand is that Jesus is not con condoning, meaning approving of any of this that this steward is doing. He's simply praising the motivation and using that as a teaching tool, as a comparison tool. All right. So we have the master. We have the unrighteous steward. And then we also have something he calls the mammon of unrighteousness. Um, and that is found in, well, in the New American Standard, it's called the wealth of unrighteousness. In other translations, it's called the mammon of unrighteousness. And it talks about um, making friends by means of your mammon of righteousness or wealth of unrighteousness. Again, verse 9 is where we find that. And what this means is basically a term that refers to riches, to physical blessings, things that you own physically. This is not the same thing as manna. I know the word looks similar. This is not manna, um, the bread-like stuff that Israel ate in the wilderness. No. This is a phrase that meant um, physical wealth, riches, possessions, and so forth. Um, and, and, and Jesus is talking about our stewardship of our wealth of unrighteousness or mammon of our, our, our physical wealth and, and possessions. Um, and, and that's what that is referring to. And, and we'll bring that out a little bit more as we go through this. Okay. So as we talked about, there's a shocking part of this parable. We've kind of got away from the whole shocking uh, parable element. Let's get back to that. In this, there is a clear shocking part of the, the parable that we've already talked about. And that is the master looks at the unrighteous steward and he praises him. He's impressed with him. And that just doesn't sit well. It's like, why? Well, as we explained, that's all part of the process of Jesus in his teaching. He's using a teaching tool of comparison. So we can put it this way. We're used to Jesus teaching good lessons about good things, about good people. Well, here Jesus is teaching good lessons from a bad man. In fact, I have a sermon I do on this, and that's what it's called. Good lessons from a bad man. Okay? So, as I said before, Jesus is not teaching that cheating and stealing are okay as long as you do it shrewdly, as long as you do it wisely, no. Again, he's not condoning, he's comparing, okay? All right, so there are three lessons that come out of, at least three lessons, that come out of this parable. And we're going to finish off this part of the lesson today by looking at these three lessons. The first one is found from verse eight. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he acted shrewdly. For the sons, now look at this, for the sons of this age, we would probably put it this way, the people of this world 
are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. That would be us, the disciples of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing that Jesus is addressing here is that the sons of the world, the people of this world, are more wise. They're, they're more motivated. They're more shrewd in getting what they want, which is far less valuable than what the sons of light have. Um, one commentator put it this way. The world is better served by its servants than is God served by his. And so as you look at this, um, let's talk a little bit about this, this lesson here. Um, what Jesus is trying to teach in this verse with these words that the master is, uh, excuse me, with the words of the master is that often the sons of the world, sinners, unbelievers, are more wise, more eager, more motivated to obtain selfish, fleshly desires than are the children of God in trying to obtain eternal life. The sons of the world are smarter in dealing with one another than are the children of God. And many times, sadly to say, they are right. A man in the world will go through just about anything, go anywhere, give up much to obtain material wealth and prosperity. He manages it well. Can we say that we have the same eagerness to gain even a greater reward or the greatest reward? Th this, this needs to speak to Christians. If you are just lazy in your stewardship, if you're just taking all the blessings um, that you have in God for granted, then he's talking to you. He's not impressed. You're not going to be entrusted with much spiritually. And how can you think that God's going to entrust you with the, 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 the greatest reward? When you're not motivated and eager and, 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 and wise in handling your spiritual stewardship or even using your physical blessings to promote your spiritual stewardship. When, when Christians come to church and they, they worship only for themselves, when they listen to lessons and they only think how does this apply to me and they never think about i'm going to share this how can i teach others that's bad stewardship and there's a lot of christians that are bad stewards they're not motivated as much as the people in this world uh lesson number two there is since we're talking about stewardship, a lesson about the proper use of your mammon of unrighteousness. Um, this comes from verses 9 through 12. You can stop and read those again. Um, the unrighteousness is more a contrast between the riches of this world and the true riches of God. So, so first... Jesus exhorts that we make friends for ourselves with our riches, with our physical blessings, so that when they fell or are gone, they will receive us into eternal dwellings. In other words, you have to be wise and shrewd using your physical blessings. Don't just squander them. Don't just use them for your own pleasures. Use them to promote God, to promote your spiritual stewardship. Probably one of the great examples of this is in the New Testament, where Paul and a bunch of churches, churches from Macedonia, 
churches from Achaia, churches from other places, decided that they were going to take up a collection and they were going to help the needy saints in Jerusalem. What were they doing? They were making friends with their material possessions to promote spiritual brotherhood and love. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that, that such actions of love, such works of benevolence, make the recipient indebted to their brother. That there is this, we're going to need to pay you back making friends with your mammon of unrighteousness. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is simply telling us to use our money wisely. Don't, don't use your money or riches in such a way that they become a stumbling block to you, to your spiritual goals. Don't waste them away like the unrighteous steward did. When push came to shove, he, he wasn't prepared for the future. Why? He wasted his riches. He lived in the present, not the future. So, so we, likewise, must realize that one day our money or riches will fail us. And when they do, where will we be? We must not worship money. We must not let the pursuit of money become our God. We must not be selfish about our money. The management of money is so important to the character and life of a Christian that God includes it as a requirement for elders and deacons. Both elders and deacons must not be lovers of money. Now, now that doesn't mean that the rest of us can be. In fact, the Bible gives us several warnings about our riches. James chapter 5, 1 through 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and following, verse 1 and following are just a few of those places. Jesus did a lot of talking about money. In, in verses 10 through 12, Jesus speaks of the Christian being a steward or a manager of riches. So first, we must realize, as Job did, that our riches are not our own. They come from God. Uh, Job indicated this when he said, Naked I was born, and naked shall I die. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. What we have is not our own. It's a, it's a gift. It's a blessing from God. He has given us the responsibility to use it wisely and correctly. Secondly, Jesus is exhorting us to use what we have right now wisely. Verse 10, Jesus is speaking to the physical world. If we are wanting to be faithful over much riches, then we will have to be faithful in a little or over a little riches. In other words, we, we will have to show that we can manage well the little we have now or no one will trust more to us that's such important because we live in a world that thinks that money is the answer to all problems we think that we can give a poor person money and and they won't have problems of poverty well that's not necessarily true the truth is that some people are poor because they simply are bad stewards with their money they squandered it and now they don't have it and what they little they do have they squander again on unfruitful things you see, people have to be good stewards of what God has given to them. And if, and if not, there is no amount of money that will help them. They might just waste it on alcohol, gambling, lottery, tickets, cigarettes, drugs, etc., etc. So in verse 11, Jesus speaks of the true riches, eternal riches. How can a Christian expect to be trusted with the true riches of God when he cannot manage there it is, the mammon of righteousness that he has now. So there is an element of now, how do you manage things versus what you will manage in the future? And that's correlated with how you are doing as a steward right now. So we must realize that God has trusted us, trusted to us the stewardship of our homes, our families, our bodies, and maybe even another man's property. 
And one day, like the unrighteous steward, we will be called in by our master to give an account of how we've managed our mammon of unrighteousness. So it's really good to think about those things. How are you doing with your righteousness or, or your riches, your wealth, your possessions? Is it all spent on traveling, taking vacations, buying new things for the house? Those things are okay, but that's all you do. Then you're squandering your stewardship. So he says, use your wealth and material blessings well. Be a good steward of them. And then finally, he says something that is repeated from the Sermon on the Mount. You cannot serve two masters. And so Jesus gives us a lesson about divided loyalty. In the lesson about money and stewardship, Jesus understood the habit of some, if not most, would be, as we like to say, to try to have the best of both worlds. Some would try to have the church that would please their conscience away from any guilt, yet not have to give up anything of their sinful pleasures of the world. Jesus understood that some would try to serve both the riches of the world and try to serve God. But Jesus says it won't work, just as he said in the Sermon on the Mount. You can't serve in the kingdom of God with divided loyalty. Why not? Well, either you will love one master and end up hating the other, or you will hold the one, despise the other. It can't be done because of divided loyalty. God wants all of you. That's why polygamy never works. Divided loyalty. That, that's why a marriage won't survive when there has been an affair until that affair has completely been ended and severed. Divided loyalty. That is why some will never make it to the kingdom of God because their loyalty is somewhere else. As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will be your heart. So those are our lessons. That is the difficult parable, the unrighteous steward. Next lesson, next week, we'll deal with the other two, starting with the parable of the talents. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next lesson.